Sister Presbyterian Church. We're glad to have you to worship today. And please take time to sign the uh, friendship pads that are in the uh, chairs in front of you. Um, let me go over a couple of announcements. There are several, so please be sure you uh, uh, look, at the, look these over. Uh, beginning um, today, December 3rd, uh, check your email for a daily Advent devotion that will consist of uh, scripture readings, prayer, reflection, uh, and devotions to aid you to prepare for this Advent journey. Uh, tomorrow morning at 8.30 will be the men's breakfast at uh, Taylor's, which is on uh, North Davis Highway. Um, on December 17th, which happens to be our choir cantata, we'll also be celebrating or having a reception for um, Barry Frost to celebrate his retirement. And on December 10th, which is next week, we will be celebrating Pastor Greg's 70th birthday. Who would, who would believe it? I was kidding. Um, our Christmas Eve service will be on December 24th at 5 o'clock. The uh, women's group, the Chat and Chew, will be meeting um, the second Tuesday of the month, uh, this time at Scenic Hills Country Club, which is on Burning Tree Road. And also, I know this week, uh, Ronald McDonald House, uh, several ladies, um, from the church will be prepared, several ladies and men will be preparing lunch at the Ronald McDonald House. Uh, we have the menu plan, but if you'd like to come and help, that would be wonderful. Um, also, we're continuing to look for donations to um, continue that ministry. So I believe that's all for the announcements. Um, so let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
decorated for the Advent and the Christmas season. So I have a special thanks going out to all of those who were responsible for decorating our beautiful sanctuary in honor of this holiday season. So thank you. Thank you all. From Paul's letter to the Church of Romans, he speaks about hope. Today, the theme of our Advent is that hope. He tells us, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Let us pray a prayer now of praise and adoration for our time of worship to him. Let us pray. <clears throat> Gracious God, we come into your presence on this Lord's Day. We pray now that you give us undivided minds, very receptive minds to the worship you in spirit and in truth. On this first day of the church new year, at the beginning of Advent and, and the Christmas season and the anticipation of it, Lord, we ask that you allow this time to quiet our hearts and our minds from all the busyness of the season. And yes, for the next hour, rest in you. Give us all hearts to be receptive to the eternal truths contained in your prophetic word. Accept our praises of song and prayer and preaching in our worship of you and your risen Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. May all we say and do here this morning as the body of believers give all the glory and honor to you and to your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. now in the call to worship which is based on Psalm 8. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, stir up your might and come to save us. Let your hand be upon us that we, be, that we may be made strong for yourself. That you will never turn back from you. Give us life and we will all Come, oh come, Emmanuel. Please stand at grave before that opening hymn.
Sunday. We do not have children's church this morning, so we invite teachers and children to remain with us for our communion service. You know, preparing for Christ's return requires an honest examination of our lives. As you know, we'll be coming before this table, the Lord's table, in a few moments today. And the Apostle Paul tells us that we're to examine ourselves, because anyone who comes to this table that is not have, has unconfessed sin is drinking unworthily and eating of the body of Christ. And so we must examine ourselves. We must come before our Lord with clean hands and a pure heart in order to worship Him in spirit and in truth. So let us turn to our Lord now, God, and confess our sins. Let us pray. Lord God, when we say Emmanuel, yes, it means God with us. You certainly are God with us. You certainly are the Prince of Peace. We look around the world and we see all the problems, the evil that befalls nations, all the violence, all the destruction and the dehumanizing ways. We see that our world is under judgment and under condemnation. Yet you remain faithful and steadfast, Lord. You are the source of peace. And the only way we can have peace with you is peace in our hearts. Let us not minimize our sins by pointing fingers at those whose sins we think are more grievous than ours. In your holy word, you teach us that all sin is sin. And so now, Lord, I ask you to shine the light of your Holy Spirit on any dark places in our hearts and confess them up silently to you in the light of your grace and forgiveness. Return us to Jesus Christ in his path of peace. Forgive us our sins as we know, and only you we can hope, and only you can forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness.
charted their journeys. By these stars, they knew God was with them. Today, we light one candle to bring the fire of the stars down from heaven to earth to nestle among the greens. We name this candle Hope. chart our path by the star of hope, even when better days seem very far away and the weight of the world seems to crush your promises, we set our face steadily towards the light. Listen now to the prayer of an ancient poet. For God alone my soul waits in silence, for my hope is from him. God alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor. My mighty rock, my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times. O people, pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Psalm 67, verses 5 to 8. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, as we search for signs of hope this week, help us to become the signs of hope that others are searching for. As these candles are but a glimpse of the light of the heavens, help us to be a glimpse of heaven's hope. Amen.
And our worshiper hymn of preparation is Hope of the World. You may remain seated for that hymn. Just a brief word about the hymn. Um, it might be a tune that we're not all familiar with. It's an ancient 16th century uh, tune, and it's got sort of a free flow without a lot of um, meter to it. So for those of you who do read music or want to try, if you'll open your hymnals, it's number 360 in your hymnals. And there's some hymnals scattered about. So I'll play uh, maybe a little bit longer intro just to kind of get some. <laughs> Genesis 80, 
18, I believe it was. Yeah, and Genesis 18. That all the nations of the earth will be blessed for you. And you, my chosen people, will be a light for all the Gentiles. Now, of course, subsequently we know what that light is. That light for all the Gentiles is, of course, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. But no, when we think about these words, when we think about a country under judgment, sure enough, there is nothing new under the sun. Here are the words of our Lord from the prophet Isaiah, beginning with chapter 64, verse 1. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood, and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down. The mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, nor ear has perceived, nor eye has seen any God beside you who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways. But you are angry and we sin. Because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. There is no one who calls on your name, for you have hidden your face from us, and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Yet, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. And then our New Testament lesson comes from the epistle to the church of Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. Paul uh, is writing this in sometime between 53 and 54 AD. Uh, he had established that church of Corinth on his second missionary journey in Greece, uh, probably around the year 50 or 51. And he's now writing to them from, uh, from Ephesus in, in Asia Minor, which is of course modern day Turkey. And he heard there were some divisions and some problems in that church, and he was he had heard that, and so he went to send them a letter to kind of straighten them out. But before he actually straightens them out as to some of the terrible things that they're doing amongst fellow believers, as a matter of fact, before he reads them the riot act, so to speak, he wants to be gentle, he wants to be pastoral, he wants to take them, and basically uh, be gracious. Then as we read on with uh, later chapters, he begins correction, chastisement, and admonition. But first off, he gives them a gentle, a gentle greeting to let them know that yes, who they are and what they are are God's people. And as a result of that, they have many gifts. They're not lacking Jesus Christ if they keep their focus on him. Turn out the word of the Lord, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning with verse 3. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and knowledge, and every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end, so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into partnership of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. May God add a blessing to the reading and hearing of this holy word. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, Thanksgiving, I think we've all we've all come through the Thanksgiving holiday. Certainly uh, many things to be thankful for. Thanks, it's, I think it should be called thanks living, that we live through it and then we turn right around and my goodness, it's already December. And it's countdown. Yes, we know that Christmas is coming. There's no getting around it, but there's many things to be thankful for. Whether it was food or family or, or fellowship or, or, or even freedom, you know, living and think about it in this, in this land of the free and, and the home of the brave, as, as we say in our National Anthem, our, our Star Spangled Banner. Many things to be thankful for. I think back to my, my, my grandmother, she was of German descent, and she said that they would offer around the Thanksgiving table what was called in German the Danke. 
Danke is, of course, the German word for, for thank, thanks or thankful. Thank the Danke. And each person would say what they were thankful for, and they would continue to say all the things that they were thankful for. Well, we carry that tradition on in our house also. Before we say grace over our meal of Thanksgiving, we stand around the Thanksgiving table, and each of us says one thing we're thankful for. Because quite, quite honestly, if we listen to everything we be thankful for, if we were really honest with ourselves, the food would get cold. So we say one thing we're thankful for, beginning with the youngest person at the table to, to the oldest. Well, as you probably know, uh, during the course of my career, I was a professor of history, uh, both full-time and then part-time after I began serving the first of my four previous churches, uh, both at the community college and, and the university level. And I was drawn to history, probably as a child, because I loved hanging around with old people. Now I look back and I decided that, yeah, I guess I've become an old people too. But I really love hearing the stories of, of my grandparents and, and my aunts and my uncles. And they would tell us what life was like back in the, in the olden days. I just love sitting on my grandmother's front porch on, on her swing on my visits to Pennsylvania. And she would tell me what it was like as a little girl growing up at the turn of the century. And I'm talking the turn of the 19th into the 20th century. One time she told me a story about Thanksgiving where she said that, uh, that uh, her father announced at the Thanksgiving table that after the first of the year, they were going to have their house wired for electricity. And this was 1898, as a matter of fact, okay? And I'm thinking to myself, electricity? Well, what's the big deal with electricity, you know? You know, what's the big deal? I mean, electricity, everybody, everybody has electricity. She says, well, no, we didn't. She says, to me, I was so thankful that Thanksgiving because I, I knew that my, me and my two sisters would not have to get up every morning and clean the kerosene globes of their soot from the night before. So she was very thankful for electricity. I remember one time sitting on that swing asking as a little girl what she hoped for most of all. You know, what did she hope for, you know, back when she was a young child, you know, because after all, I'm thinking about these people I'm talking to, that they lived through great technology changes, whether it was a electric light bulb or whether it was the telephone or, or what it was it like when you saw your first car come speeding up the street at 15 miles an hour or what was it like when the first airplane flew over and, and of course the, the world wars and the depression and all these things were exciting and, and I, I said you know what did you most hope for and her, her answer caught me off guard she says I hoped I would never get polio or that they could make a medicine for of course, to an eight-year-old, I think I may have been at that time, or maybe 10, I don't know. What's polio, really? You know, what did that mean for a little kid? Well, you know your history, that polio for a little child, it meant that obviously a child wouldn't have infantile paralysis or basically it affected children. And they would be crippled for life. They would absolutely have to wear lead braces or crutches or wheelchair. Perhaps they would have to spend time in a machine called an iron lung just in order to breathe. It was every parent's first nightmare until 1954 when Dr. Jonas Salk developed the first polio vaccine, followed in 1955 by Dr. Sabine and the Sabine immunization. You know, that condition would lead to an unproductive, a debilitating, a, 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 you know, a life that was pretty much chained a person to limited activity. And I found that interesting because polio has been eradicated really as a world disease now. I mean, I think it only exists in like two countries, Afghanistan and I believe Pakistan, still have instances of polio. But looking back, I found that interesting on my grandmother's part. She most hoped for something that she did not get a dread disease. And if they, she did, that there would be medicine to take for it. But sometimes I think in our own lives, we've got to look back at the past in order to look forward to the future and to see that we have and what hope we have. We begin, of course, with Advent. And what do we do? We look back at Advent to a degree in the Christmas story. We look back to that very beginning, the very first time that Christ came on the child, this scene, as a human being. Think about that. A little baby becoming a human being. God lowered himself, came out of his throne, and as we just sang, 
Emmanuel, God with us. God came with us in, in human form. I think it's important that we think that we must look back and we must look back at the future. But then it calls us in hope to look forward to the future, the past, the future, the back and forth. Think about it. You know, the Romans, the Romans, ancient Romans, had a, had a god named Janus. And uh, Janus, uh, they believe that Janus, J-A-N-U-S, Janus, rule over transitions in a person's life. They rule over birth and death and youth and old age and, and weddings and funerals and hinges and doors and, and seasonal events like spring planting and fall harvesting. As a matter of fact, coins in the ancient Roman world were depicted as two faced, two heads only, one looking backward and one looking forward. And you probably know that's where the month of January comes from, the god Janus. We look back at the end of an old year and the beginning of a new year. We know, as I said, Janus represents beginnings and endings. And today marks the first Sunday in our church year, Advent. It's the first Sunday in our church calendar, Advent. It comes from a Latin word clearly, Adventus, which means, which means coming, coming. Well, what are we coming to? Well, we're coming to, obviously, the Sundays leading up to Christmas, but also to it points us to look forward to that preparatory season where on the next four Sundays, or the next three Sundays now, we get ready to engage two central aspects, two central aspects of the Christian life. First, we're called to make ourselves remember the first coming of Jesus. And yes, we will remember that first coming of Jesus. We'll remember them in the scripture passages we read. We'll remember them in the music we sing, those beloved Christmas carols that tell of that first Christmas. To relive that historical story of the one who was born, a threatened and vulnerable baby who lives a wandering adult life and eventually submits, we know their history, to a painful and shameful death on a cross. But secondly, secondly, we are called to look ahead to the end of history when the kingdom of God will be fulfilled and the lordship of Jesus Christ will reign for all of eternity. You know, a large part of our, our, our Advent preparation talks just about that, the second coming of Jesus Christ. And if you were here for the last three Sundays, you know that we looked at Matthew chapter 25. We looked at three parables that Jesus told his disciples. First, he told them that, yes, he's coming back. That was the story of the wise and, and, and foolish bridesmaids. So get ready, be prepared, because he's coming and you don't know when. Just like that bridegroom came. Jesus Christ, the bridegroom, is coming to reclaim his bride. This is us, the church, that he owns. He's betrothed to it. He bought and paid for this church. You and me, the fellowship of believers, through his blood on the cross. So he's coming back to reclaim that which is his, his bride. He tells us in that second parable, the parable of the talents, that use the gifts that God has given you. Don't be asleep. Get ready. You know, don't hide your talents in the ground, but use them to build up my kingdom, to advance my kingdom, because, and that's where we get to the third parable, there's going to be a judgment day. It's called the judgment of the nations. And Jesus Christ is going to take, and he's going to separate the sheep from the goods. And as I said last week, when the king comes, he's going to put one on his right hand and one on his left hand. And friends, we don't want to be a goat on the left hand because we have not served the least of these in his kingdom. You know, many Jews uh, in the first century were looking forward to the Messiah just as they had been looking for the Messiah coming in those seven centuries that Isaiah talked about. And most of Old Testament literature talks about the fact through many references that yes, there is going to be a descendant of David, King David, the greatest king of all, David, there's going to be a descendant of Jesus who's going to reign on that throne forever. If you think about it, Isaiah's reading says that they were under oppression by the Assyrian Empire. But the Assyrian Empire is dead and gone by this time, seven centuries later. The Assyrians were conquered by the Babylonians, who were conquered by the Persians, who were conquered by the Greeks. And now, Rome is under occupation of the Romans. The Roman people, poor old Jerusalem, poor old Jews, you know, once again, the nation of Palestine, the nation of Israel. Is under is under subjection. But these people, they looked for a kingly, a powerful deliverer. They wanted it to be in the mold of King David, a mighty warrior. That was a natural hope. And there's one reason why many people probably found Jesus as 
not the kind of king we're looking for. You know? And as we point forward later on, coming into the next year, as we get into the season of the Lent, you know what people were asking for on that on that Palm Sunday when they hailed him as a king. Hosanna to the highest, the king who's going to come and deliver us. And they shouted these hosannas. They thought he was going to become a king to deliver them. And what did he come? He came riding meekly on a donkey. See, his kingdom is not a kingdom of power like that. His kingdom was a different kingdom. The strangest thing, it turned out, he was the Messiah. And he came to become a crucified Messiah, not a military victor. We know that word hope. The sermon title, of course, is called The Promise of Hope. Just as the Jewish people hoped for that Messiah, and yes, they missed him the first time he came, we too hope for the Messiah to come again, <coughs> to set things all right. And this time, we're not going to miss him. We're not going to miss him. You know, Mary around us lit the candle of hope. And hope was proclaimed. Hope was proclaimed on that first Christmas when those shepherds were out in their fields. And what did they say? Peace on earth. Peace on earth. Goodwill to all mankind. And together with that, there is the hope that yes, there is a better destiny in shore for us, awaiting for us. Either in the imminent return of Christ in our lifetime, or awaiting us when we meet him in eternity. You know, it's the hope that lies within every human heart that, that tugs at our hearts if we think about it. And it makes us understand that we are only temporary pilgrims here on this earth. We are only passing through. It is what C.S. Lewis said, that, that we were made for another world. And we were. And we're waiting for that world. It's a hope that assures us that despite all of the strangeness and bitterness and hardship and sickness and wars and evil we see in this world, there is hope for a better future. Hope for a better future under the kingship, the lordship, and the sovereignty, as I said last Sunday, when Christ the King Sunday, of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Peter Berger, Peter Berger, who I enjoy reading, Peter Berger wrote a book, a marvelous book called A Rumor of Angels. Very encouraging book. And he said that sometimes we see in our own daily lives what he called signals of transcendence. Now, transcendence is something that's just a, a simple one way of understanding, is that transcendence means that God is so far beyond us. He's up there, if you will. But really, yes, we say in our Apostles' Creed that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God the Father. So heaven is sort of up there. After all, Jesus Christ ascended into heaven. So we look geographically that heaven's up there. But what Berger says in that book, that God is so amazing that he can be both transcendent up there, but he can also be imminent. Imminent. That means right here and now. Right here in this very church this morning. Through the work and the power of the Holy Spirit indwelling in each and every one of us and spiritually present. It's something that we can hope for. And it gives us hope whenever we have fear or anxiety or cares about anything within this world. To know that God is not so far away that he's not right here with us. I'm sure many of you as a parent may have experienced uh, a child who may have been frightened in the dark by maybe a bad dream. Uh, or maybe they were worried that there were monsters under the bed or in the closet. And they cried out at night. And so what did you do as a parent? You went in and you sat on their bedside and you comforted and said to them, it's all right. I'm here. It's all right. I'm here. I think back many times when, I, when I, our own daughter was very small, very small, okay, probably not even two foot high, and we would go to the beach, and I would walk her out into the waves, and of course the waves were probably to my knees, and they were probably to her, uh, you know, up to her waist, and she would cry out, Daddy, save me from the sharks, the sharks. <laughs> she meant sharks. But she would jump up in my arms and the waves came in, thinking that the waves were going to bring in sharks, save me from the sharks. And I said, don't worry, dear. It's all right. I got you. She knew she was saved. And friends, that's what we know in our book. We know that with God eminent with us, we are also saved. Do parents lie to their children when they tell them in the dark of the night that it's okay, I'm here? The hope is that child that yes. Mommy or Daddy's here, and I can go back to speak now. I don't need to worry about anything. 
Or after all, think about that. If we look at our world around us, as I said, with disease, whether it's cancer or hunger or war or hatred of people because of their ethnic or racial identity, I can't even believe that, that even in this day and age that, that anti-Semitism would still be. I thought we got rid of all that stuff years ago. I thought the Holocaust did away with all that hatred of people because of their religious ethnicity. But you know, we live in a fallen world and evil is still darkens men's and women's hearts. Everything isn't all right always. But Berger claims, and I agree with him, that comfort and reassurance, that comfort and reassurance that a parent offers a child, it's not a lie, it's not deceptive, but a true insight that's vital for every child to grow up to be a vital human in maturity. In other words, in our Christian lives, in our Christian lives, it should be a profound conviction for each and every one of us, but because of our promised hope, everything is going to be all right. A belief that that hope that will save us through the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, a belief that God is in control and with his knowledge and hope that he is working his purposes out for greater glory, a belief that I, no matter what, can rest in that hope and faith. And yes, God's got it under control. God is above my pay scale. All things are for his glory. All things are by the imminent power upheld by him. And that hope arises whenever there's a crisis or challenge in my life. You can ask Judy. We always rest in the fact that we will be fine. A hope that Jesus promised that yes, he's coming again to establish his kingdom to make all things right. And I believe most of all, and rest in the fact that my belief comes from an unconscious perception that somehow is found in my Bible about the love and the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. God cannot lie. His word does not lie. So as part of our Advent celebration over the next three Sundays, we're going to be exploring in greater detail the promises that we have. Yes, the promise of hope that we have today, but also the promise of peace, the promise of joy, and yes, the promise of love. You know, some people talk about hope, and, and, and they sometimes get these confused with optimism or wishful thinking. Optimism springs from a calculation of how things may turn out, and the belief is that, yeah, okay, things won't be too bad. Wishful thinking is the feeling possessed by some people who says, gee, maybe if I perhaps put a dollar down, I might win the Florida lottery. But neither of those attitudes is the same as the hope expressed in our Bible. Our Bible, the Christian Bible. The Bible that takes and says what the Apostle Paul told us, for in hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. Okay, so the hope's unseen. Hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Paul says that in Romans 8. And he goes on in Romans 8 to say that all things work for the good of God, especially for those who love him. And the corollary or the counterpart of that is because he first loved us. And nothing, nothing in this world and most definitely in the next can separate us from that love that we have in Jesus Christ. Yes, we have to be patient for that hope. We have to be patient for that hope. Why? Well, it's just like an expectant mother. You're going to have a baby. But yes, it's going to take nine months. You can't rush the process. But that hope is filled that yes, on one day, there will be a day of delivery. That hope is fulfilled in the birth of a child. That hope is fulfilled in the finished work of Christ when he returns again. So as I conclude, I want this season of Advent to give us the opportunity to pause in all the hustle and bustle and all the preparations that we have for Christmas Day to slow down, slow down for a little bit, breathe, rest, to reflect seriously on that theme of peace and joy and love and hope. And yes, even think about death and the moral seriousness that's going to call our lives into judgment. Advent gives us a chance to reflect, gives us a chance to take and seriously think about our lives in the coming year in the light of those two great facts. He came once and he's coming again. 
And friends, get ready because that is our promise of hope. To God be the glory in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All things in heaven and earth belong to God, who is coming in glory to reveal a new creation. Let us now faithfully and graciously present our morning tithes and offerings to our Lord.
We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Let us pray. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord our God, creator and ruler of the universe. In your wisdom you made all things and sustained them by your power. You formed us in your image, setting us in the world to love and to serve you, and to live in peace with your whole creation. When we rebelled against you, refusing to trust and obey you, you did not reject us, but still claimed us as your own. You sent prophets to calling back to our way. You are holy, most God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son. In Jesus Christ, born of Mary, your word became flesh, and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. He lived as one of us, knowing joy and sorrow. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, opened blind eyes, broke bread with outcasts and sinners, and proclaimed the good news of your kingdom to the poor and the needy. Dying on the cross, he gave himself for the life of the world. Rising from the grave, he won for us the victory of life over death. Seated now at your right hand, he leads us to eternal life. We praise you that Christ now reigns with you in glory and will come again to make all things new. Holy, 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 Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let us pray. Our gracious Lord God, who by your sacrifice gave us the gift of life, you truly are, Lord God, the bread of life. We are the branches. You are the vine. As we partake of these elements, Lord, make us mindful that apart from you we can do nothing and that you hold for us the words of eternal life. And for that we lift up and praise you and give you all the glory. Amen. Continuing our worship, let us pray the prayer that our Lord taught us, our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, this is a joyful feast of the people of God. It is the Lord's table, and our Savior invites all who trust in Him to share this feast, which He has prepared for all people who will come. Men and women will come from east and west one day and sit at the table in eternity, presiding over by our Lord Jesus Christ. Ministering in his name, I invite you to partake of this feast. This is the Lord's table. It is not the table of the Northminster Presbyterian Church. It is not even the table of the Presbyterian Church in the United States of America. It is the Lord's table. And so I invite all of you to partake. We give thanks on the night that Jesus died. He took bread and broke it and gave thanks and said, This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In like manner, he took the cup and he said, This is the cup of the new covenant of my blood poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread, and drink this cup. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Will the elders come forward?
Remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, we take from your creation this bread and this wine, and joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we await for the day of his coming. With thanksgiving, we offer ourselves to you to be a living and dedicated sacrifice to your service. The body of Christ given for you. Your 
people gather in homes and churches to celebrate this season. Let us be reminded of all the reasons we have to rejoice in you. Let us remember of your protective presence, your gentleness, and your love, and your peace that passes all understanding. May it guard our hearts and minds, Lord, this Advent. Save our God and rejoice over your faithfulness in our Lord Jesus Christ. May we continue to pray continually for our church community, this family, this body of believers, each and every one, both those present and those not, that, Lord, as a people of faith, we may continually be faithful and true to you and to your word, lifting up these prayers to you, trusting that in your name you hear them and receive them through your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. A closing hymn has come, Thou Long Expected Jesus. We stand in grave before that closing hymn. Thank you.